Welcome everybody to the uh, Birth to Three Meltdowns and Challenging Behaviors presentation. My name is Mary McWilliams. I'm a community parent educator here at Oakland Family Services. Um, and today we're gonna go over a few things that I think all parents experience and go through and learn through their process of uh, being a parent for a child who's um, from birth to three. So starting off, um, we have this picture here that evokes a little bit of emotion. Um, what are some thoughts when you see this, this little kid? Tantrum. <laughs> yeah. It looks like it's coming. Or it's in the middle, or, it, or uh, it's working its way out, right? <laughs> all right, I think it happens to all of us, right? All kids go through some phases like this. Um, so let's talk about what kind of roots these challenging behaviors, which um, we see as difficult emotions. Is there anything on here that sort of stands out to you? the uh, disappointment. Yeah. yeah, that's a good one. It's one that we don't always think of right away when we think of, of um, like negative emotions, rooting challenging behaviors, but being disappointed um, absolutely can be a big part that, that funnels into these challenging behaviors. I thought failure as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that feeds into disappointment, I think, mm -hmm. too, part of that. Um, fear, that fear. stands out to me a lot. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes when we feel fear, it doesn't always come out as the cartoon characters we always think of when we talk about fear, right? We're not always like chewing our nails and like biting our teeth. Um, sometimes fear can come out as anger or rage. Um, one, of, uh, one that stands out for me as well is mortification. Feeling embarrassed sometimes we don't always think can root into tantrums, but absolutely having... Um, that feeling of maybe shame or, or feeding into disappointment um, can be part of that for sure. So let's talk about uh, what causes some of our difficult emotions. Anybody felt any difficult emotions today? Um, not today, but last week I did when I had a blowout with my tire. I remember that. <laughs> so that, yeah, that was like, it caused a lot of anger. It caused a lot of fear when I heard my tire go boom. Yeah. So, yeah. A telegraph. And yeah. Telegraph at <laughs> night and it's dark. So, yeah. I know. I had difficult emotions <laughs> hearing about it. I was like, oh my gosh, a telegraph at night. Are you okay? Anybody else? I mean, we're on the top of kids. When my child had a tantrum this morning, I was very frustrated because I was just trying to get us both out of the house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you feel helpless, right? Mm -hmm. um, absolutely. That is so frustrating because you're just like, come on, can't you just see? I just need like two minutes of cooperation. This is not the time to have a tantrum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, it, it's winter time, right? So on Monday or two, yesterday when I had to clear up my car, um, it was, it took forever. <laughs> it took way longer than I thought it was, uh, that I thought it would. So living here, I think I, I get that difficult emotion in the morning. That really frustrates me because I don't park in covering or garage or anything. So it's super frustrating for me to clear off my car. Like probably irrationally so. Like it shouldn't be that extreme. But for me, I'm just like, oh, this is not fair. <laughs> Even though yeah. it happens to everybody. <laughs> Like, why couldn't it just snow in a box around my car? And the wind wouldn't, you know, blow it on. And uh, I uh, cracked my um, phone this last week, too. So that's something that I know, right? I'm frustrated just hearing that happened to you. <laughs> I'm so irritated by it. I know. Mm -hmm. it, like, it stops you being able to function. It was actually the back piece um, for, for that for my camera, so I can't use the back camera at all, which is definitely not the world's biggest problem. But it was just a surprise that I was not uh, happy about. It was uh, it was not a good moment. Um, any other things that you can think of, maybe that aren't on here, that cause some difficult emotions? Sadness is a big one. I I didn't want to put a picture of something really sad on there, but absolutely feeling that um, it can be hard to sort of move through when you have to get to work or, you know, function with your kids or things like that. So, you know, loss, grief, things like that. Yeah. Um, okay, well, let's move on to the next big question. What causes some of your child, your children's uh, difficult emotions or your clients if you don't have your own? What about being told no? 
That's a major one. And I was actually just going to speak to that. Um, just off of a child, just having a toy taken from them. That, I mean, that just enrages them. Anybody else have any other examples? I think having like difficulty communicating. There you go. Um, so if you have a young toddler who um, may or may not have a language delay, you know, if they're trying to get something across to you that, you know, they're hungry or they're thirsty or they're upset and you're not really able to take the cues, you can definitely see the frustration building up. Yeah. Yeah, and absolutely all kids probably feel that they have a delay even if they don't because they're not able to communicate as much as they want to in the moment. So that's a great example of uh, something that I'm guessing all kids go through. And that's why they call them terrible twos. Part of it, that's one small part of why we call them terrible twos, is um, having that difficulty with expressing your needs, wants, and your emotions. Um, yeah, <laughs> there you go. Yeah, which is sometimes difficult for me. <laughs> I like to stay up and hang out. Bedtime's not always the easiest time. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Bedtime can be a hard time for, um, for parents, for kids. Meal times, nap time related to bedtime, getting dressed, diaper changes. Did I say bath time yet? No. Um, okay, so we've explored a lot of um, difficult emotions and I think we've found a lot of overlap between what causes us difficult emotions um, and what causes kids difficult emotions. Um, next up, let's talk a little bit about emotional development. We're all born instinctually um, with the urge to be controlled by our emotions. Um, so that's already built into our blueprint, right? Through the process of emotional development, which happens arguably through our entire life, <laughs> um, we all learn to recognize and manage our personal emotions, identify and understand the feelings of others around us, and communicate our thoughts and feelings effectively. So um, these three things are essential in being able to sort of live in the outside world and, and work um, in our society, right? You need to be able to do all these things to be able to get along with people. Um, and that's such a vital part of how we do things. Um, this all kind of starts with um, the root of development. So I have this... Um, we could call it a painting. It's an illustration that was done by a research study um, with 700 volunteers from Finland, Sweden, and Taiwan. Um, these volunteers were interviewed and asked to use paint on these um, figures to illustrate where and how they feel their emotions. So can you guys see it kind of clearly? Oh good, the words are showing up. So what are your thoughts when you look at this? My first thought is that love is so similar to other things and happiness like mm -hmm. obviously Pride. not any of the bodies are all up and down but mm -hmm. same places are lit up that you feel when you feel love yeah anger and love look kind of similar mm -hmm. right and anxiety mm -hmm. and pride yeah absolutely fear and disgust have some of those same elements mm -hmm. um contempt shame surprise so what about um depression and neutral, they kind of look similar to me. Um, they have, they're almost inverted, mm -hmm. right? Where the, um, the zero, the even, the black is, the, um, the, cold, the negative five and 10, what we might assume to be the cold, um, are inverse, inverted. There's a lot going on when we feel emotions, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of actual physical feelings. So we can imagine what it's like being a small child and trying to figure out what these feelings are, but actually physically feeling happiness can get easily confused with anger sometimes when we're trying to figure it all out, right? So that could be why uh, some little kids could like bite when they're excited, mm -hmm. hit when they're excited, or like mm -hmm. uh, when I nannied, I had one of my kids... Um, he would hug his baby sister too, like, too hard. When he got around her, he was just so excited, and he just loved her so much that it, I think he just wanted to like melt her into him, and it was, 
It was nerve wracking because it's a baby. <laughs> be careful. You have to be careful. Um, but he was so young that he didn't really notice that. He was just like, oh my God, we have to be close right now. Um, and so he was so excited. Um, any other thoughts on this? Does this model what you guys think you feel when you feel some of these? Except for pride. Pride? I don't understand it really because it looks just like anger. Yeah, it really does. Yeah, pride and, pride and anger do look really similar. Um, I think if we were in this study, we would really have to try to, I, I don't know exactly how they uh, interviewed, but we probably would have to think of several situations where we felt pride and try to think about, um, uh, you know, how that kind of came across. I can kind of see that, but that would be a really hard one for me to illustrate. To, mm -hmm. you know. Because I'm wondering if they're looking at pride as like the type of pride where it's the good pride or mm -hmm. the type of pride where it's the oh, bad like pride. Arrogant like pride. Like nice Arrogant. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. um, so in looking at these bodies and these emotions, um, do you feel that any of them are tied together? I honestly, I feel like anxiety and shame look alike and it's really because I guess as in shame like a preemptive feeling of anxiety like when you feel anxiety you preemptively feel shamed about something yeah i think shame would de would definitely be able to funnel into um you know deeper levels of anxiety so if i'm if i were feeling ashamed about maybe um if I'm thinking like with my toddler cap on, so I'm ashamed maybe because um, I'm not able to really potty train as well, but I'm trying and I don't quite, you know, understand my body feelings and it's hard to do um, that it, it comes from an anxiety maybe of wanting to, um, to please my parents or please um, my caregivers, you know, making sure that, um, that I'm being the best person I can be. And even the reverse, right? That, in, um, that, Anxiety can be an offshoot of, um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And kind of along the same lines as with neutral and depression, it's like the neutral. I usually like when talking with clients, I usually see them in like a neutral form, and then if nothing, if they don't like try the coping skills or anything like that, like down the line, they kind of look like the depression, mm -hmm. where everything is just kind of like cold. Yeah. Or even when they come to see you, it's the reverse. They come in depressed and then they hang out with you and they're able to work back up to that neutral mm -hmm. spot when they are using these coping skills that you're teaching them, right? And they're pretty self-happy. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> we could do a direct <laughs> line. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love it. Um, great. So any other observations, ladies and gentlemen? All right. So next up, let's talk a little bit about uh, what emotional development looks like in our babies and toddlers. So really briefly, these are not uh, set in stone. These are just typically what comes up as our babies are developing. Um, but, you know, every kid moves at their own pace. Um, around six months, kids are starting to reflect emotions, or even at birth sometimes, starting to reflect emotions. They'll smile at you when you smile at them. Uh, they might cry if things get scary or stressful, and um, they're beginning to recognize their familiar adults. Um, even out of birth, there's studies that kids, uh, babies can recognize their parents' voices um, above the nurses and the doctors there and show preference for those voices that are comforting. Um, at 12 months, um, kids are beginning to intentionally interact with others. So they favor certain people above others, which is probably a, a struggle for caregivers, teachers, um, parents when we're trying to get through the day. Um, at between 18 and 36 months, oftentimes there can be an increase in tantrums and challenging behaviors as kids learn to understand and manage their emotions. They're um, modeling behaviors observed from other adults and children, sometimes leading to challenging behaviors. Sometimes these modeling behaviors show them great coping mechanisms, which is why we're always wanting to sort of pay attention to what we're doing when the kids are around, because those little sponge brains are going to, you know, take whatever is provided to them. 
Um, and around three years, kids start to verbalize and understand a wider spectrum of emotions, um, the nuances to their emotions, and emotions expressed by others. They may still have some tantrums and meltdown behaviors. Frankly, I know adults that still have tantrums and meltdown behaviors. So it's, <laughs> like I said, emotional development goes through our whole life. And it builds on what we're provided with. So when kids are provided with an environment and caregivers who are able to model healthy emotional development, it better preps them um, to be able to, uh, to, to do things in a healthy way. Um, so emotional development is dependent on brain development. These um, the two brain scans, uh, we've got one on the left, that's the healthy brain of a growing toddler. And um, one on the right is a um, brain scan of a child who grew up in a Romanian orphanage. So um, in those Romanian orphanages, due to the um, war that ravaged the country at the time, their orphanage orphanages were overburdened and children spent most of the day um, in their cribs by themselves with little interaction with others, um, which is a deeply, um, horrifying event, um, but brain scans from this have really helped us to illustrate how important that um, interaction with others um, is, so that um, extreme deprivation is quite visible in the comparison um, brains. Um, so being able to provide children with environments that let them explore, learn, and grow, and, um, and interact with others um, is, is um, vital, and these are a great visual way um, to be able to show that. Next, we have another illustration. Well, I guess that was a brain, brain scan. This is an illustration. Okay. Um, so we have an illustration of neural pathway development. So in our brains, we have these neural pathways that connect all the parts of our brains. These are the lessons that we learn, the skills that we develop, um, and all sorts of things that um, are brain inputs throughout everything in life. Um, as newborns, we, we have some neural pathways that are already there. We're already able often to make noise, to grasp our hands, to... Um, to suck or drink. There are things that we're just born with being able to do. Um, after one month, we see that our neural pathways have kind of doubled, right? There's a lot more going on, even at just one month. And when we think of one month old infants, there's um, so much that's sort of doubled or going on in their head um, that even though they still seem pretty young, pretty close to newborn, um, they're taking a lot in. They're, they're making observations, they're um, learning to focus their eyes, um, to begin to try to control their movements and sounds, the cause and effect of crying and somebody coming, all these things. Um, between one month and nine months, this is kind of a bigger jump, um, and we see tons more synapses. And some of them are strengthened and thicker. Um, they're all connecting in, in different ways, and at nine months, kind of makes a lot of sense. The difference between a one-month-old and a nine-month is pretty big. It's pretty considerable. Um, at two years, which is an even bigger jump, we have um, a ton going on in there, right? There are tons of synapses firing all over the place. It's mass chaos, maybe one might say. There's, um, a, there's um, some lasting neural pathways that have strengthened. Um, there's just tons going on. I mean, we can imagine what it's like in a two-year-old brain um, and why we might call them then the terrible twos. And there's just so much um, that they're working to figure out and make happen. And then we see in adulthood that we've strengthened a lot of the synapses that we use all the time. So oftentimes by adulthood, we're like, we've figured out how to walk and keep our balance, some of us. <laughs> some of us are a little clumsy. Um, We've, or we figured out maybe some of these strengthened synapses could be um, ways to communicate with others, ways to understand what's going on in our lives. One of those synapses could be like writing daily reports, which is some, a skill that we use every day. Um, so we've really strengthened some of the skills that we use, and we, we can see some larger spaces that we've pruned away, we've cut away some of the synapses that we didn't need. Maybe the synapse for like melting down and throwing a tantrum on the floor, we 
we shed away because we realized that didn't always work well. Or, uh, I don't know, something else. Whatever. Whatever behaviors we want to shed, hopefully they're gone by adulthood. <laughs> and that's what we're trying to uh, help kids do, right? To model healthy behaviors. Um, any other thoughts when anybody looks at this? I feel like the synapses grew so much more between nine months and two years and like between two years and adult it's like mm, like you learn some stuff but it's almost like the, it just shows that the majority of learning happens during that yeah at, at uh, from nine months to two years is a big jump and we can think about what how kids present differently from nine months to two years old that's a big gap so motion management. So we talked a little bit about emotional development. Let's talk about how we um, manage or work with this. And of course, what we've kind of all been touching on a little bit is are these meltdowns, right? That kids can have meltdowns from any one of those emotions that we saw painted out, right? There is that yellow red level on most of these and anything can trigger a meltdown. You know, having too much fun, too much uh, input, all that stuff um, can really contribute to um, just not being able to handle it. Um, I want to ask you guys, and let's explore the topic of what uh, does a meltdown feel like from the inside. So let's put our toddler caps back on and think about or try to picture having a tantrum and a meltdown. Um, for any reason, pick, pick your favorite reason a tantrum and tell me what does a meltdown feel like? An explosion. Nice. A release. Give me more. Fire. I was going to say a tight chest. Mm -hmm. Rage. Yep. And fire fire associates with hot for me too, so I'm just going to put that here next to it. You just feel warm. You feel hot, right? Um, what else? What, what might it feel like on the inside? Like a lot of tension. Tension. Uncontrollable. Mm -hmm. What about scary? Mm -hmm. yeah. You're feeling uncontrollable. Your chest is tight. You're hot. It could be a little scary. Mm -hmm. Maybe overwhelming? Yeah. Overwhelming. Mm -hmm. I'm worried I'm not going to get my way or I'm not going to, or what if it, this never stops, right? Like I have to imagine that. Mm -hmm. At what point will there, this yeah, end that, that I'm feeling this way? Mm -hmm. It's scary. Like how long am mm -hmm. I going to have to temper tantrum mm -hmm. so to, get to get what I want? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I, I as well sometimes wonder how long I'm going to have to throw a fit <laughs> to get my way. It was weird, like my nephew, he doesn't throw tantrums often, but when he does, it's like the last time he threw one, like he was crying and like the crying led to more crying because he started yelling like, oh my God, I can't stop crying. <laughs> oh, and he just kept, he, like every time he said he cried harder. Um, and okay. I was like, I laughed because I was like, I don't know what to do about that. <laughs> that like snowballs. Yeah. Like a man because they didn't get their way, but now they're mad because they mm -hmm. are mm -hmm. like, something's not on TV and then mm -hmm. it just it, like mm -hmm. snowballs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll if they can't year. come out of it. So I think we got some really great options here, some really, really good descriptions. Okay, so next question I have for you. Um, what does watching a meltdown feel like? Exhausting. I think it can be frustrating. Frustrating. Absolutely. Like a waste of time. <laughs> but when you're trying to get ready to go to work, yeah, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and there's another, there's maybe other ways we could try to say it, but that's sort of the root of it. It's like I just don't have time for this. Maybe I'm helpless mm -hmm. to reroute this 
snowball, if we're using the same analogy. Um, or like the Indiana Jones thing. How about we do that? What, what would we call that? The rock ball? Yeah. Boulder. Boulder. Um, what, what else? And sometimes you're just unsure. Sometimes you just don't know why this child is tantruming. They're confused. Yeah, yeah. So they're frustrated because they can't communicate with you, and you're frustrated because mm -hmm. they can't communicate with you. It's frustrating. Mm -hmm. It can also be confusing because we just had a conversation about how we're not going to have to stay here, or we don't have time to stay here mm -hmm. past five minutes, and now the five minutes up is up, and you were like, okay, I'm ready, and then all of a sudden we're having a tantrum because we don't want to leave, but we just talked this out. Come on, guys. Get with it. That's how I feel. Like, come on, get with it. Um, what else are feelings that you go through when watching? Embarrassed, is that up there? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> That's a big one. Doesn't even matter. Even if you're in the privacy of your own home, it can still be embarrassing, especially if you have a family member, a friend, a neighbor over where, you know, you're just like, man. I'm helpless and I'm like I don't know what to do and yeah sometimes that stress can feel like this is a reflection on your caregiving um, when really all parents have felt this you know so even in a public place if someone's staring at you it's because they don't have kids mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> right or they they have this I misconception I always try to smile at other parents who have yeah children with that are having a meltdown yeah because i want them to just be like get yeah. it it's okay people yeah. are living this yeah right like, yeah this is your yeah. job like i got you yeah and you're doing a good job <laughs> yeah because you're killing it yeah you're, killing. <laughs> you're doing a good job because that's all you can do is ride it out sometimes you know um any other feelings um Thoughts? i would say some parents could feel very fearful about okay. it. Um, they're fearful that their child may physically hurt themselves while having mm -hmm. this meltdown. Mm -hmm. Or another child could physically get hurt. Yeah. Especially mm -hmm. children that have like head banging issues mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. self-harm behaviors. Absolutely. Can be very scary. Yeah, yeah. Or if they're near the stairs or mm -hmm. we're having a tantrum outside and I don't know, there's a danger, an unspecified danger near. <laughs> I was thinking fearful down the route of like, am I doing this right? Like, mm -hmm. am I being the right kind of parent right now? Yeah. How do I react? Yeah, yeah, like just kind of. And maybe not able to relate to like why they're tantruming. Mm -hmm. You know, like okay. unrelatable. They can't put themselves in that. That's a good one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes as adults or uh, people who are trying to be adults, we forget what it's like to be so out of control um, or so um, rooted in our emotions. As we grow, we learn to deal with that and accept it and we kind of forget that we had to make that effort to do so. Absolutely. I'm gonna flip the script and say sad. Okay, cool. Um, I had a client that I was working with that had a very difficult time with emotional regulations um, and was working with infant mental health and a lot of, he was in foster and had been in several places, um, but he would tantrum from excitement feelings as well as, you know, being upset and it's not really something that we think about a lot, but, you know, he'd like get really excited and then he'd just start losing it and then all of a sudden it would turn into a full meltdown and I just remember the foster parent being you know, very empathetic and, you know, very, you know, trying to understand and trying to help him cope through that, you know, where, you know, we usually just think of it as, like, the frustrated side, like, oh, why are you doing this? Mm -hmm. But on the flip side, like, children that have been exposed to a lot of trauma, like, sometimes it can be yeah. heartbreaking. To Absolutely, especially when there is that trauma history involved. Um, anything else we can think of? Uh, I don't know the word, like the parent not feeling understood. Okay. So, misunderstood. Yeah, there we go. Uh, I think that's a great one. And as parents, we're like, come on, I just said let's get our clothes on so we can go get ice cream. <laughs> like, why are we melting down right now? This is meant to be a good thing. Yeah. You love going to grandma's house. <laughs> why are we having a problem with this? <laughs> Do we see anything overlapping? Mm-hmm. Helpless. Helpless. Mm -hmm. I can't see it. Confused. 
I don't know why uncontrollable isn't on the watching side, but it should be. Yeah. <laughs> There's no timeout on the uh, editing, so let's throw them all on. Controllable, and I also like, um, what was it, exhausting over here. Having a tantrum, being inside a tantrum, exhausting. The kids need a nap afterwards. We all do after a tantrum, <laughs> right? Um, do we do overwhelming? Yeah, frustrating. Do we write that on here? We don't really have to circle all of them because I don't have them all in the right order. We did helpless, right? Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay, so there's um, a lot of overlap that sometimes when being in that situation of watching a meltdown, we could take a moment to think, oh my God, we might be feeling the same thing right now. We're both really helpless and we're frustrated and we're exhausted and we're sort of feeling out of control, not in control of the situation. You know, maybe we both need a hug. <laughs> All right, so what do we do? What do we do in situations where we're going through feeling this, we're watching kids feeling this? Um, what do we do in situations, um, oops, during meltdowns? You tell me, you guys have the answers. Take a quick break for yourself. Yeah, if possible, if we're, especially like if we're at home, kids in a safe space, they're not, you know, gonna knock something over on top of them. You could step away for a second, you know, when possible and, and with age appropriate children, you know, I need to just have a moment to breathe. We want to think about how we're going to react before we react. Mm -hmm. So absolutely. When we do, we want to sort of calm things down and we don't want to explode things further. We listen, right? Mm -hmm. Tr trying to figure out exactly if we don't already know the cause of the meltdown. We're trying to understand what's going on, to weed through the things that are exploding out, to try to figure out, like you said, how can I best solve this situation, right? Mm -hmm. We kind of oftentimes, when these things are happening, go into problem solving mode because we don't really have time for this. Rarely do we have time for a meltdown. Doesn't matter what's going on. It just wasn't in the plan for the day. <laughs> so we're wanting to try to problem solve. Um, what are some problem solving techniques that you've used or that you recommend as a provider to parents? The communication, like getting eye level with the child. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Being accessible, mm -hmm. getting on their level. Right? Mm -hmm. Staying calm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Low tone, low voice tone. Yeah. I'm embarrassed to say that I bribe a lot. <laughs> I bribe. Well, and it will be like, you don't want to wear your coat, but I thought you wanted to go to grandma's. So it's like, you have to wear a coat to go to Gigi's. Like, that's a bribe. Or if you want to eat pancakes later, we have to put our coat on. Or, you know. I think when used appropriately, and effectively that um, rewards can be really helpful versus like bribery, you know, I'll give you this candy bar every single time you're trying to get them to do something. They'll refuse to do it until they get their candy bar. That can be a non-productive way to or sort anything. of use rewards. Anything else that we do or we recommend to parents? Um, I think just labeling the emotion, um, mm -hmm. that will make a big difference so the children can know what, at, what actually that emotion is that they're feeling. Mm -hmm. Also giving out choices, and I know you were just speaking about bribery, but not bribing, giving out choices so they'll understand, okay, I'm not just saying that, like, I'm just speaking, if it's two different toys, I'm not just saying that you have to play with this toy, but you have the option to play with this toy, or you can choose to play with this one because such and such is playing with this toy right now. Yeah, not an option. But yeah, here are, but here are two other options for you to choose from. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. like yeah. Too. absolutely. I love the labeling and explaining mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. even for children who don't have that language, um, like that, that language, uh, expressive language, they're able mm -hmm. to work on their receptive language. So they may not be able to say it, but they're able to begin to understand what's going on because Ms. Ms. Faith has explained it to them. And, you know, even if they can't explain it later, it, you're setting that groundwork. Any other thoughts 
um, or recommendations for people. I think through every tantrum, we're always kind of doing something different, usually. Nobody can react consistently the same, even when we're trying to use positive reactions, um, because we have stuff going on ourselves, right? There are moments that a tantrum in the middle of a casual Saturday where we don't have time restraints that I might be able to work better with in a tantrum than out in the grocery store where we just have 10 minutes left before we have to go get your sibling from place, yeah, yeah. <laughs> insert place here. <laughs> One of the things that I've recommended uh, to parents too um, is just to not to take the, the tantrum personally. Mm, absolutely. Because a lot of times the uh, parents will see this tantrum and start to think like, oh, I'm not a bad parent or this child is ungrateful Question. or just that the other. And so yeah, I just tell them, you know, like, yeah, like not to, don't, try not to take it personal because it's more so about their emotion and how they're feeling versus what you are actually doing or if you're you know things like that absolutely that is exactly feeding into what we talked about in being present for a tantrum is um as a parent you could start to feel embarrassed questioning your skills frustrated and you start to feel all these emotions <clears throat> as a reaction to experiencing this meltdown and your brain starts to go places and it's really important to take that moment to reflect just a quick pause, even if it's two seconds, to remind ourselves, this is not a reflection of me as a caregiver. This is not a reflection of me as a parent. This is a reflection of my child developing their skills. They're just in the middle of developing their skills. They're working through it, and I need to sort of take myself out of this emotional spiral that happens from watching a tantrum <laughs> or, or experiencing that meltdown firsthand. Um, so then it's easier to sort of make those healthy reactions. In the boundless sea of emotions that is a meltdown, kids need you to teach them how to float. So um, in this picture, first thoughts. Tell me, what do you think when you look at this picture? Terrified. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Terrified. Terrified. Anything else? I mean, it's a type of, like, coping, really. I mean, you're teaching a child to more or less save themselves in the case that something happens that they might be in danger of drowning. If they fall in the pool, you're teaching them how to flip over, you know, so it's like a preventative measure. Any um, specific observations? She only has her hands under one of them. That's what really is <laughs> I think that's why I'm so scared. Like if one yeah. doesn't figure out how to float, she's only there to save the one that she's got her hands under, not the other. Uh, but looking further, first of all, all these kids are already floating. Mm -hmm. So they're already doing what they need to do. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little scary. It looks like either this one in the front is crying or about to sneeze. I, <laughs> I'm halfway on that one. <laughs> this middle one definitely looks like they're crying. And I think yeah. that's why the um, lifeguard, um, who's, she's a trained professional. She's like sort of reading that cue and seeing that this kid is scared. Um, she may be about to pick her up or she may just be reading that cue and seeing that this kid is scared. Um, she may be about to pick her up or she may just be uh, maybe just touch her under the water to show that she's there. Or, I don't know what's healthy. Please don't take my recommendations. I don't know <laughs> if that would startle her. <laughs> I didn't ask what the technique was. Um, but the kid on the end. Uh, really yeah. Very content. Yeah, so initial reaction, because I think these kids are in the forefront, we see crying, scared babies, and as caregivers, we're like, oh my god, I want to gather them up. But it looks like this technique has happened to work on that kid on the end. Mm -hmm. Already, this uh, third child is like, oh, I got it, all right. And eventually, these other two are likely to come around, right? So I, I love this, this picture kind of elicits that immediate like oh my god i want to jump in and help literally i will jump into the pool with my clothes on and this microphone on because i want to like save that baby save that baby but there uh there are already these coping mechanisms that have started the babies are floating there's one that's calmed down so it's there's a lot more to it when we um so take a moment to be patient through that. So I, I absolutely appreciate that observation that it's, it's kind of scary to see. And the same thing with watching your kid ride a meltdown in the middle of Target. It's kind of scary.
The next slide, which um, Ray already touched on, is being accessible. So you can see the differences between the photos. Does anybody have any observations? Well, on the left, the child has to put their head all the way up like this just to see um, their caregiver's face, their expression. Mm -hmm. And then on this one, they're smiling at each other and she's <laughs> making eye contact with her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think in the one on the left where the kid's looking up, they're already in a position to be like, ugh, <laughs> like, come on, <laughs> right? Just even physically, <laughs> I would be more prone to be like, come on, what are you doing? Being <laughs> Just that eye look was like more inviting. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And even from like a, a physiological standpoint, like this picture over here with the head back, this kid isn't able to get like appropriate like oxygen to the brain or blood to the brain so they're going to freak out even more mm -hmm. because of how that feels physiologically yeah. Yeah. whereas the other one they can everything just kind of like they can they don't have to hyperventilate <laughs> <laughs> absolutely what a great observation that even just physically right being in that position you're struggling a bit more to breathe to calm you've got that tension in your neck to reach it up um, I don't exactly remember what it was like to be that small, but I bet you're just staring at kneecaps for most of the day, right? <laughs> and you're not able to reach as many things as you want. And so in those little moments, um, when possible, when you're able to sort of get down on that level, you're able to alleviate, uh, alleviate um, some, some of that tension or frustration. Um, not assuming, though, that getting down um, at, to eye level is going to immediately solve a meltdown or challenging behavior. It can just sort of assist on that path going towards um, communicating more effectively. And showing that you're calm, that you're there, that you're sturdy, that you're in front of them, that you see them. Assuring them that you're there for them, um, which I guess goes in that analogy of of being that anchor in the storm, um, teaching them how to float in that storm of a meltdown, um, that you're present, right? Because meltdowns can be scary, confusing, make you feel helpless, all these words that we've um, kind of labeled it as. And um, when you're accessible, when you're present, uh, it can just make a huge difference. Um, and it is a chore to remain calm and to be patient, but I think it's vital um, in helping everybody get through the meltdown. Um, and offering physical connection and support. So that goes back to my theory of we all just need a hug. <laughs> um, a physical connection during a meltdown when appropriate, when there's no danger, of course, I don't want anyone to get hit in the face or um, or like, in my opinion, even worse, get your glasses broken. That would be <laughs> so devastating. That picture was on my difficult emotions thing. <laughs> I'm very dependent on my glasses. So um, we want to be careful. We want to um, be safe and make sure everybody's safe. But offering that physical connection and support can really show a kid like, hey, you're mad right now. I can see that. We're labeling like Miss Faith taught us to, right? I know that you're mad. And I see that, you know, but I'm here and we're going to get through this together. I know what it's like to feel mad, right? But we can always take a moment and calm down. Um, does anybody have any thoughts on this? Hugs are so wonderful. I don't From the little ones. <laughs> From little ones, yeah. <laughs> in good moments, in happy moments, and in difficult moments, mm -hmm. I think yeah. that feeling a meltdown and all that uncontrollable stuff that goes with it and watching a meltdown happen and all that uncontrollable stuff that goes with it we all can use a hug mm -hmm. and it can just help to anchor both of us you know you're sort of using each other to take a moment you know to be present to be sort of mindful um in the moment take a deep breath and then you know hopefully solve some problems or whatever I don't know, whatever the root of the tantrum was. Um, but that can help both of us to calm. Um, what are some techniques that you might use or encourage to prevent meltdowns and tantrums? We sort of talked about the aftermath, but is there anything we can do to sort of try to, when possible, prevent? Set expectations ahead of time. Mm -hmm. That's, That's a good, a good one. one. Kind of moving into the bribing, um, sometimes <laughs> I have suggested to parents, 
you know, um, to use like reward charts or a similar kind of reward system where you set the expectation, okay, we're going into the store, you know, if you can sit in the cart and, you know, not have a meltdown or not try to grab everything off the walls mm -hmm. and stick it into the cart, you know, we're going to get a star or maybe afterwards, maybe we're going to get a piece of candy, like, and give the reward specifically for the good behavior. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, sometimes people, I think, just expect that their kids are going to know how to handle different situations. If you're going somewhere that's going to be very overstimulating, or, mm -hmm. and this child hasn't um, done that before, like going to the movie theater or places like that, you know, you kind of have yeah. to tell them what they're going to expect and, you know, what their expectations are for how that they're going to behave there. Absolutely. That is a great great method in being able to sort of set that um, that mutual understanding, that mutual expectation of we're going into the store, we're going to see strawberries. I know strawberries are your favorite, but they're not on the grocery list today, mm -hmm. you know? Maybe another time we could do that, but what we can get today is flour. We really need to find the flour. So if you could help me find the flour and stay in the cart when we get home, we will draw a picture to send to Miss Faith when we go to school. <laughs> um, the charting, I think, is really great. Those reward charts you spoke about, helpful for kids who are a little bit older, but still really useful to even build that groundwork when we have older siblings to be putting our zero to three kids on there because we want to be able to, at the very first moment, um, set these expectations and get into the pattern of, you know, paying attention, observing the kids around us, listening um, to the rules, and that just helps everybody's life when we're automatically learning rules rather than had to, having to retroactively correct behaviors. Um, so setting expectations, love that. Mm -hmm. um, anything else? Um, I think, um, I'm trying to see how I can put this into words. I think um, sometimes we know what are the triggers that causes our children to have a temper tantrum. Mm -hmm. So basically planning day by day to make sure if that's a trigger for them, you would change that situation. Yeah, or do helpful prep for that situation. Mm -hmm. yeah. So your nephew comes to mind when talking mm -hmm. about school, you know? when we If every day we know that this is a situation, then we could try to build little rituals or... Um, little patterns into our morning that help to prep us for that school moment. I don't have anything specific. If I had this really beautiful idea, I might throw it out there. But, um, but if we had time to, you know, sit and ruminate on it, we could um, try to think of things that he really likes. You know, we're going to set this here on the counter, and it's going to be waiting for you when you get home. And you're going to be able to tell it two things that happened um, today that were kind of scary or frustrating and two things that happened today that were really good and fun you know setting these ground uh, this groundwork for having calming times when we encounter triggers you know like being told no absolutely I've seen it time and time again um, or having to share your toys, you know, your cousin's coming over. When your cousin comes over, you know that all these toys become everybody's toys. And so if mommy or your aunt or uncle or your cousin want to touch it, that we are all able to play with it. And then once everybody goes, we're going to put all these toys back to where you, you know, like them to be. When I nannied, I, I nannied for um, a child who really had difficulty when other kids would touch and move his toys around. He's like, I have things where I like them. <laughs> like, I was working on building those cars into a specific shape. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. that was part of his learning process, was really trying to like let go and not be in complete control. Mm -hmm. You know, and that can be rooted in other things, of course, but we're sort of wanting to work within um, how behaviors exhibit, how that comes out, which was really having difficulty um, sharing. And it wasn't just like someone touching my toy, it was they're moving it out of place, right? Um, any other techniques that really help us? Um, I like the, you know, acknowledging and predicting triggers. Um, and that really helps us to plan out what we're going to do. Um, and when age appropriate, right? Not all kids at all age levels are going to be able to listen to the story of, I know we're going to go see strawberries, but we can't touch the strawberries. You know, it, there's, we're going to have to work with what, um, wherever our kids are at. 
So, um, yeah, so we're going to sort of problem solve in the moment. And as parents, you know that there's going to be some wins and some losses, right? Not all planning goes the way that you try to make it go. Um, but that learning, that practice, those efforts all make you a good, effective parent that nobody's perfect and um, and that you know as long as you're um, not causing harm neglect or abuse <laughs> and as long as you're trying and it comes from a place of love and you're really working your techniques around um, each individual child because all kids are, have different personalities and different development levels um, that we're you know we're all on a good path of being those good parents that uh, those good caregivers, those good teachers, those good providers um, that we want to be. So uh, just to end the presentation today, the Before Three Succeed program um, through Oakland Family Services offers different tools to help your baby grow and thrive. So like those services that we spoke about with Oakland Family Services, if you have concerns about behavior, um, we have home visitors that will come to your home for free at your convenience to help assess. But if you ever wanted to check out your kid's development on your own, we have a link to what's called the Ages and Stages Questionnaire, um, the third, which is, I believe, the most updated version. This link listed on here is in English. It is available any time of day um, for any child, zero to five, as many children as you have, as frequently as you want. You can fill out this questionnaire that will look at the, um, the domains of, or, or the areas of language and communication, of fine and gross motor skills, um, <coughs> excuse me, fine motor skills being those small muscles that we use to like draw or pick things up, um, gross motor being the big muscles that we use to run and jump and balance, um, problem solving skills and personal social skills, all those areas, this questionnaire will be able to compare your answers with answers that other parents and caregivers have given for children in that age range and let you know how, um, based on your answers, your um, child is developing in comparison to others. Um, so it could help to give you an indication on where, uh, on the areas of strength that your um, kid is really meeting their peers and on any areas that could possibly um, use some encouragement um, or some attention. So the link's provided there. It's on our website, the Bible for Three to Succeed website and any of our handouts. And thank you all for coming.